my mic working, it should be. I see some people all joined. Uh, feel free to uh, mention in the chat what you uh, like to see out of this. Make sure you have a chat window, so Q&A window. It is 11 o'clock and I expect it to be uh, starting the live stream right now. Uh, however, um, I don't see uh, Vlad. I do see that the chat is, which is awesome news. Um, so we can, uh, you can, oh, Vlad is here. He's trying to get it. Awesome. Allowed to talk. So Vlad, I voted you. Hey, I didn't can you hear me? see you a second ago. Yeah, I can hear, hear you fine. Awesome. Have you been waiting for long? Uh, no, it's just uh, it's got me joining as an attendee, and I uh, thought it was gonna um, have me join with my camera. <clears throat> yeah, um, right now it doesn't allow you to use camera. No, I think it's got me as a normal attendee. Oh, yeah, I think I just promoted you to panelist. There we go, magic. Uh, we're one minute late, so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm Sid, I'm CEO of GitLab, and I'm joined by uh, Flat. Flat, you want to introduce yourself and maybe what you do? Sure. Um, CEO and co-founder at Turtle. Uh, so we make it really easy for startups to find freelancers all over the world, and for freelancers all over the world to work with U.S.-based startups. So we're both run a remote first company. Um, or as I like to call it now, all remote, like everyone's. Remote. And uh, Vlad, uh, want to discuss some things? So I say, uh, take it away, and we'll keep yeah. an eye on the on the chat. Sure. Um, so I thought we'd both start off and just talk about how we got started for remote work. Um, it's been around for a while, but I'm guessing we both had untraditional starts. So Sid, do you want to maybe start? Yeah. So first person I hired was in uh, Serbia. I was in the Netherlands, I said that didn't work. And then my co-founder was in the Ukraine. Uh, so I started working remote and I uh, ended up hiring a bunch of people in the network, my network. And I had a single desk at home and uh, I like invited them in and they came for three days and then they kind of started working from, um, because all the tools were there um, and why not? We never kind of discussed it, but they kind of ended up starting to work from home. Um, that continued until we joined Y Combinator and there they said that works for engineering, but not for sales and marketing. So we got an office in Soma and uh, the same thing happened. The, the uh, Hayden, the salesperson came in for three days and I started working from home. We never discussed it, but like, why come to the office? The, the, it takes, takes an hour each way to commute. And then the only benefit is that you hear sit on video calls the entire day. What, Interesting, but uh, slightly yeah. distracting. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I think we were just in that spot where video card, like internet connections got good enough and you had like blue jeans and now you home, uh, which make it easy to do. And I kind of continued and uh, many executives joining were like, oh, this is worth a few weeks. They were like, well, my life certainly improved. And guess what? I, I've learned to, uh, to communicate with, with my words and build rapport. And I think the trick is a lot of video calling. How about you? Um, pretty similar in that I just kind of fell into it. Mine started a lot sooner though. I was in undergrad and I had a internship that turned into a part-time job at a company called Merkle. Um, and they were awesome and kind of early to the game with, Hey, we don't care if you come into the office or build some hours from home. And I remember sitting in a, actually in a more mundane class in undergrad. So I hope none of my undergrad professors are watching. Um, and I remember logging in and billing a couple hours during a more boring lecture. And I was like, wait, isn't this work. Um, so that was kind of my first exposure to remote work. And then both companies that I've started, Darwin Apps and Turtle, um, we wouldn't have been able to become real companies if it wasn't for remote work. Just the price of talent in the US has gotten so insane that unless you take the traditional route of VC funding and hiring people for what the average salaries are in New York and San Francisco, it's impossible to compete. Um, while there's great talent all over the world that you can tap into if you can forego a traditional office. Seems yeah. like a small sacrifice for great talent. <laughs> well, it's, I don't think it's a sacrifice. I think it's, I find it more enjoyable. Uh, yeah. To, uh, I get more done in a day. And I, I, now in a normal meeting, I like hate it that we're not collaborating in a group, but there's someone taking notes and that's someone after that, our meeting has to compile the notes and then we have to agree those were the notes. And we have the Google Doc in front of us and, and everyone can see what's happening right there and then. Yeah, I agree. The asynchronous nature of remote work is better even if applied for in-office work. Like whether you're sitting across from a desk on video calls or simply in a room together and you're logging everything versus being in different rooms, there's a lot of benefit to it. And I think we both are, are huge remote work uh, proponents. Um, so. I, uh, I was thinking to make this interesting. Maybe we could both chat a bit about cases against remote work yep. or at least cases that we've heard. Let's do that. And by the way, uh, Yashu, thanks for mentioning my voice was strange. I hope that's uh, fixed now. Um, the case against remote work, uh, I think it's really hard to run a hybrid company where you have part remote, part of the people remote and part of the people at the office. It tends to be that the people at the office keep doing what everyone else does, um, impromptu meetings, not taking notes, um, not doing video calls. When they do join a video call, they join with like the whole table so that you have like bad audio and you can't see the faces of people clearly. Um, so that's really hard. If I had a company that was like 80% co-located, I would not allow 20% of the people to work remote because already for us, it's really hard to enforce these standards. I can only imagine how hard it is to enforce standards. Um, hmm. if, if you're hybrid and standards, I mean like every meeting has a Google doc, every meeting starts on time, things like that. Yeah. I mean, those sound like great standards, whether or not you're remote or not. Um, I, I hear you on the difficulty of it. I think it's something that, that work as a culture has to fix though, because it'll be much more difficult for companies to transition fully in-house to fully remote versus being able to hit some hybrid in between. I think it'll just fundamentally make the, the ecosystem more difficult to add or move remote if you can't cover the hybrid piece. Yep, um, I, I do think it will be a case of like creative destruction. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, I think we were lucky to like build a new company and build it all remote. I think that's going to, there's going to be lots of new companies that get started this way. And at some point you'll have to change. But I, I think, I think we'll see the trend that a higher percentage of startups will be all remote until most new companies are that. And then startups take a, a 10 years to mature and then 20% of the companies is all remote. And then the big ones will start changing, but it's going to be, that's going to be a, a big, big change. Yeah. Um, I tried to think of a couple of cases. So, I mean, the obvious ones to me were anything close to birth and death. Uh, I think birthing people remote, very difficult. So some things in the medical profession, especially those that involve kind of high touch, 
um, as people get sick, et cetera, I think that's very difficult to do remotely. You need the human touch. Um, that said, things like even cancer screenings, et cetera, being able to send those over remotely to review, I don't see a case there. So then I tried to find some other cases against remote work before starting this, this webinar. And you know, there was some that seemed a little silly, like IBM forcing everyone to move remote. That seemed like just a control tactic. Um, some that start to make more sense, like Apple, where they're an incredibly secretive organization and the theory is they keep everything in house and it's less likely for things to get out. Questionable, but starts to make more sense. Um, and then there are some that, that didn't really add up to me and just start, sounded like really bipartisan. Um, it was actually the Andreessen Horowitz podcast, the like last one that came out last week or so. And Ben and Mark both go on there and they really just said, uh, they think Silicon Valley will keep getting stronger. They didn't say like remote work will not happen. And I think that there's a tendency in the community to kind of be incredibly bipartisan today. It's like either you're totally for remote work or totally against remote work. Like what I think uh, Ben and Mark were saying was you will keep hitting collisions in Silicon Valley um, and it'll still be an epicenter for collisions. And at the same time, other areas might become stronger. And at the same time, remote work will become stronger. And I think that's kind of the stance that we have to take to embrace remote work culturally and, and inside of our own organizations. Otherwise, it's going to keep being this like, yes, remote or no remote one way or the other sort of thing. Yep. Um, there is something to being in person. Uh, I tend to have lots of dinners with people. There's something to breaking bread together to, to having sharing a meal. Um, it creates a, a setting that's, that's great. We bring the whole company together every nine months, GitLab contribute, and it's a great experience. Something happens in your brain when you've been in person with someone else. Um, and we should not underestimate the, the value of that. I believe that um, very high bandwidth exchanges, mostly where people riff on each other, um, that is still hard, like playing jazz together is very hard because remote because of the latency. I think there's something else to be said for like working on ideas together. When we, we come together as an executive group uh, every quarter and we come together in person. If, if you're remote, it's like really hard to interrupt someone to add a thought or something like that or to, 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 sh to show how you're supportive or not. There's all these known verbal clues. I think you get 80%, but you don't get 100%. And uh, I, I do think that there's value to meeting up in person. I think that will keep happening. I think where collaboration is, tends to be hardest is between companies because you need more trust. So for that reason, I totally agree that Silicon Valley and specifically San Francisco will keep being the epicenter. Everyone in our company that regularly has to deal with external parties either lives in the neighborhood or flies flies in um, and and that's that will not change um, there is something our, our brains do something when you've met in person with some, someone else and and I think that will continue being the case yeah um, I mean I'll even give an example like you know turtle at this point is a much smaller company than GitLab um, but the reason this live stream is happening is because we happened to be at an event in San Francisco and I tweeted at you and then we ended up hanging out for an evening and organizing this. That would not have happened if that was a remote interaction only. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, I think we'll share a recording. I just made a note. Um, it should be on a YouTube channel, either a YouTube channel GitLab or GitLab Unfiltered. Um, so... On the note of kind of taking the benefits of in-person and the benefits of remote work, um, I think our lens of looking at it is we've always basically been 100% remote. We just naturally fell into it. Um, how can a company that's not remote today, you know, let's start with the small startup and then let's move our way up to companies in FANG. Um, how can they start motivating either their teams or their, their leaders or, you know, just the org in general to start adding remote? Yeah. Um... I'm not an expert at that because I've never done it. Um, I guess one way to do it is to have like a remote day at the company where no, where no one is at the office. Before you do that, of course, uh, convince everyone that, 
or not everyone, but try to convince people about the case for it and then how much time they'll save and, and all the other things. Get your tooling in place. Um, and then after you're, you're able to function as a company being uh, remote, at least for a day, then I think it's time to um, make sure people are not missing out. So if you have an all hands, make sure there's, there's a camera there that records it and someone that relays questions that are asked from, from other people or have telepresence robots. Uh, we, uh, like we, like we have one uh, in, in my home here. Um, things to make sure people are not missing out. People don't come to work because they like to commute. People come to work because they don't want to miss out on relevant information and career opportunities. Um, so it's very important that, you, that they hear everything. And I think in most companies, there's a lot of relevant information you cannot get in another way. Uh, when we, for example, were fundra fundraising, um, we had a fundraising channel. You had a play-by-play -play of like, we had this meeting with a VC and they said no and they said yes and et cetera. Normally that's only done informally and you have to kind of catch a CEO coming in back from a call and then ask like, hey, Sid, how did it go? If, if that's the case, people will come to the office because they carve that information. Yeah. Um, brave, I think that's brave, a, brave that information. Great. Yeah, I think that's a great reason for coming in and meeting with your team. Um, more often I've seen some bad reasons like being there because they think that they have to. I think if you're seeing anything like that in your organization, you should just call it out and recognize it in yourself. Um, you know, if there's a good reason for being somewhere, embrace it, run with it, repeat it. If it's a bad reason and it's just the way that things have been done, potentially it's worth calling out and, and stopping. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how many companies, even companies uh, that are very recent and very well run in many other regards, still value input. Um, I, I know output is hard to measure, but you, that has to be the thing. If you start measuring people and hours worked and who stays late, it's very dysfunctional. Yeah. And there's a question that came in that's pretty relevant to what we were just talking about. Um, I think maybe we can break up the discussion a bit and answer some of the questions. Kind yeah, of throughout. for sure. Yeah, make sure you repeat the question. Yeah. So Andy Tiffany asked, uh, I joined a bit late, so not sure if this has already been discussed, but what are your thoughts on the importance and frequency of in-person gatherings at offsites? Andy, we did cover, you know, being 100% remote doesn't replace getting together and, and having either executive level or company-wide offsites and gatherings. Um, I don't think we got into detail as to, you know, tactics for that. Um, so what should the frequency be? How should you think about it financially? Um, you know, without having a formal office and the equipment and rent and all that that goes into it, there's obviously a bunch of budget that can be left over for things like this. So Sid, how do you think about it? And then if there's anything that you don't cover, I can jump in. Yeah, um, definitely do it. Uh, we do it every nine months. We found that the ideal frequency for us, uh, we do it for a week. People have to come from all over the world. So if we do it shorter, it doesn't jibe with the travel time uh, for people. Um, we try to make it worthwhile. Like you, you don't come to sit through presentations. We can do that every day. We do that every day. There's a presentation from a certain department in the company about what they're up to. Uh, so we don't do that. Um, it's, there's an opening ceremony then there's lots of excursions, then there's an unconference for a couple of days, and then there's a closing ceremony. That's it, only the opening and closing ceremony, people sit down and watch, a, watch, watch someone on a podium. Uh, so that's, that's crucial that you make it about meeting the other people, sharing meals together, doing stuff together. Um, Budget-wise, it's, it's super expensive. Um, we now are also inviting people from outside the company to them. Um, we're even trying to sell tickets publicly. I want to make it about more than just a company because if it's, it started to be more than a million dollars per event. And then when things are bad, people start looking at that line item. Now things aren't bad, but you always have a rough, rough quarter every once in a while. And I want to make sure that, um, that, the benefit is more than just the team members yeah. for, for individual groups that need like high bandwidth decision-making across different things uh, makes sense to bring them together. Um, 
but I, mm-hmm. I, I, the costs the cost are not only monetary, but also we see productivity dip by half in that month. We do half of our sales, we do half of the feature shipped, which is shocking because it's just a week. But like the prep time, the downtime afterwards, people taking vacation in the, in the location, and, and just people getting sick, traveling, it's, it's really yeah. costly to, to travel, uh, mostly yeah, because of productivity. Higher flu, right? Yep, uh, the flu, the, the gift. Higher flu. And, um, um, go ahead. I, uh, I wonder though, like, I mean, it does get expensive and I, I, I do bet that those productivity drops happen. Um, but I wonder if we look at it over a year, you know, not over that month's productivity, but over a year's productivity, I would bet that it looks the other way. Um, and then on the cost perspective, a million dollars is a lot, no matter how you twist it. Like that's a line item that needs to be looked at. But if you're at a smaller company, whether you're an employee or a founder, I think we have to recognize just like what the costs are of office space, two hours of commuting each way. I mean, if you have high level talent, two hours of commuting each way on its own is an expensive line item in a week's worth of time or a month's worth of time. So organizing an excursion where, you know, you're paying five, ten thousand $10,000 for a small group or ten, twenty thousand $20,000 for a small group is typically less than a month of rent for real office space. Yep. Uh, of course, like the commute time mostly accrued to the individual, not to the, the company. It's, it's their benefit. Um, our, our budget for the, uh, for the event is $3,000 per person uh, for travel and, and the location. Um, we get to go to great places. Um, we're pretty flexible. So we ended up in like South Africa and Greece and, and, and beautiful sites. Um, and, and like even companies that are co-located and still do offsites for them, there's less travel tends to be less travel involved, but imagine that like, it's not something you need because you're remote. It's just a bit more expensive because you're remote, but the, the need is there, uh, anyway. Yeah. Cool. And, and um, I, our, our attendance is, um, 90%. So people really do want to be there and it, and they think it's useful. And I guess for the uh, for less of the offsites and, and gatherings and more on just like formal meetings, what we do is we get together about once a quarter. Um, we do goal setting for that quarter. Um, monthly meetings can still happen remote or remotely, but in person is executive quarterly gatherings. Um, what is your frequency for the executive gatherings? I think you said monthly. Uh, no, every quarter. Every quarter. So you guys also do a quarter. Cool. Yep. Well, Andy, I hope I answered your question. Um, if there's anything else, you can just follow up in the Q and A. Um, so- Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, uh, uh, I was hoping that, you know, we could find something in remote work that we disagree with, uh, make it a little interesting for the audience. Um, you know, we both have strong opinions, I'm sure on certain things. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll get there, but I thought we'd give it a shot while we're live. Uh, is there something that you have a strong opinion on that is unpopular, uh, relative to remote work? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I see that you don't believe that 40 hours a week should be the norm. Oh, I think I have something I've had so far. I know some digital nomads that are absolutely doing fine, but so far in GitLab, they haven't been very successful. Now sample size is like two people. Um, but people that travel the entire time, uh, to new locations that they want to explore, um, they tend to not do really well. I can I, see people like staying somewhere for like seven months at a time or something like that. But if you travel to Bangkok for a month and then Singapore for a month and stuff like that, that t- tends to not go well. And I think one of the reasons is you're continually hanging out with backpackers that don't have a day job. So it starts becoming really hard to get the discipline to work enough hours and put enough focus in it that and your regular commute becomes an irregular bus trip or flight or backpack journey or something so you're adding the commute logistics to it as well um we've seen similar things happen with some freelancers on turtle that are that are nomads um so yeah i think it's one of those good in theory uh hasn't worked in practice yet sort of things yeah i think that there's a few people who manage it but they they tend to stay longer per location yeah, agreed. Um, I wanna, 
someone asked how, how we deal with all the regulatory and financial nuances of running a business internationally as a startup. Um, I think you're, you're referring to like employing people and hiring people. And uh, that is hard. There's no fixed answer. Uh, we have entities like we incorporated in, I think, more than six countries now. So we can put people on our payroll there. But we also hired people to resellers. Uh, we also have a lot of people that are contractors. And you have to kind of dive into the specifics for each country to determine like what is the risk of having people there. And it, it depends on like what, how many people you have there, what business you do there. Um, and also like the, the local law, obviously. Um, yeah. I think that's a great question. That's going to apply to more and more startups, you know, as it gets easier to even a two or three person team might be in two or three countries. Um, are there any services or anything like that that you've used? that help you kind of navigate the waters on how to work internationally? Yeah, we, we have a, a bureau which, whose names escape me, but uh, they, they help us like look at the risk of every single country. Uh, I've used, for example, Manpower as a payrolling service in Serbia to hire Madin, um, but it's, it's a bit of a patchwork. Hmm. Yeah, I hope that gets better. Just as kind of like video conferencing and all that has gotten better, I hope the infrastructure for global work gets better. It's a massive part of remote work. Yeah, I want Stripe for employing people. Yeah. Um, then there's another question from Hassam on how can you control lazy employees in remote work? Um, I think that's an easy to do one. Yeah. I think it's, it's in office. You shouldn't have lazy employees. Yeah, well, it's the same thing. Like, I think in an office, you, you can be um well first of all i'm lazy like every, every every talented person should be lazy and not want to do any work but i think what what he's referring to uh, is is people that are just not uh, producing results and uh yeah you should manage underperformance and that means uh, telling those people that they're not producing enough and and if they're trying to coach them to to improve the situation if not um, suggest they seek employment elsewhere or let them go. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's the case everywhere. I think um, using kind of people showing up as a proxy for doing work is just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You can have, you can show up every day and be the most enthusiastic person and then still not produce a lot. So our, our number one value is results. And, and I think being remote forces us to uh, focus on that. Yeah, and I would say that there's a certain word in there. It says, how can you control lazy employees in remote work? Um, whether or not they're remote or in person, I wouldn't look at it as control. I would look at it as objective and goal setting. And if they're hitting those objective and goals, everything's good and you don't need to correct, otherwise you do. Um, the moment that you look at it as control is the moment that you start measuring if someone shows up at nine, has their butt in the seat, and then leaves after five. Yep. And uh, there's another question. When we get together, do we pay for travel in a hotel? Yes, we do pay for travel, accommodation. We do fun stuff. Like we go to Cape Town, we go to vineyards, we, we climb Table Mountain. Uh, uh, it was a lot of great things. Uh, we even pay 50% for your significant others. So if you want to bring them along and they're interested in GitLab, then uh, you can bring them along. Cool. And on our uh, kind of ROI and costing question, Tammy posted a really nice link in there. I haven't seen that before, but there's a nice link in the chat that lets you kind of calculate what your uh, remote work ROI is to the employer and to the employee. So that's a cool reference. Thank you for that, Tammy. As a junior deaf, it's hard to find remote work, someone remarks. Uh, yeah, totally agree. Um, I think... Um, there's a couple of things. Maybe training is easier in person. I'm not sure. But also, because remote work, it's kind of a, an employer's market right now. Like it's a lot more people wanting it than employers willing to offer it. So companies tend to go for more experienced developers if they can, so they don't have the overhead of, of training people. Um, so as a junior dev, it is, I can see that it's harder to find a remote job. Um, I think also there's lots of hybrid companies that just where it's hard for them to train you if you're a remote. Even, even at GitLab, I think training is one of the harder things. You really have to. 
go in video calls together and do things like that. And, uh, and if you just stay in chat the whole day, then it's not going to go well. Um, I don't have any special tricks to find remote jobs. Obviously, you can search for them and there's just multiple websites for them. But uh, I wonder if Vlad has an opinion. Yeah, I think there's a more fundamental piece of what he's asking there. So as a junior dev, um, I think it's as a junior dev, it's just harder to find work than as a senior dev. So I would focus less on the remote piece and more on how to both present and level up the skills to appear less like a junior dev. Whether you find a senior dev to pair with and the two of you can collaborate on projects together and you can do more of the execution and, and the senior dev can help with more of the strategy and kind of the sales part of it, um, or eventually getting to the part of playing that senior dev role yourself, at the end of the day, you have to be able to sell, present, and deliver. And if as a junior dev alone, you can't do that remotely, find other collaborators that you can do that with. And there are plenty out there. Yep, and, and do like courses, learn, read Martin Fowler's refactoring book. Like there's lots of things to, you can do to make yourself better. And yeah, junior, in the end, you, you wanna be able to just remove it from your uh, title. And, and get on Twitter, like people want to help you. Like there are senior devs that will take you under their wing, especially if you look like somebody that's promising. Like there are plenty of humans all over the world that wanna help you, so get your name out there. Um, let's see, we got a couple more in. Uh, so Sam asked a really good question there. Sam uh, Rudabau asked, how much do you consider remote employees location, uh, cost of living when setting their salary? Um, I think maybe we can think about this first in the US and then internationally as well. I think this is a really difficult question internationally. Yeah, so we have a global compensation calculator. Maybe someone can post it to the chat. Uh, just Google for GitLab global compensation calculator. And one of the factors in that is the location factor. And it's not about the cost of living. It's not about but it's about the market rate. We want to pay kind of at or above market. Um, and the market rate depends on where you are. So we want to, uh, we factor that in. And we have different rates in different regions in the US, but also different regions elsewhere in the, in the world. I think all in all, there's, there's a couple of hundred locations in our calculator. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think for us, it gets a little more difficult because we, we kind of, you know, we hold this fundamental theory that it doesn't matter where you're born or where you're living, your skills should determine your income, not your birthplace. Um, so for us, we, I don't think we have a perfect formula for it yet. We, it's one of the business challenges of Turtle in general to figure that out. Um, right now, we, we pay very similarly, no matter where somebody is, uh, but it's lower than what a senior dev in the U.S. would get. So we simply don't take on devs in the U.S. because we can't compensate them in the same way that we think they would expect and deserve. Uh, finally, we found something we disagree on. This is awesome. Uh, we're paying local rates. I put a link in the chat. Uh, you can also Google GitLab paying local rates. And that's for five reasons. Um, if we pay the same rate around the world, we'll have a concentration of people in lower wage regions, uh, regions because GitLab is a better deal to them. Uh, so we won't be all, all across the world, which we want to. Um, it also means many times uh, the, the way the market uh, rate is um, correlated with cost, like San Francisco, highest, highest pay, but also highest housing prices. Um, so it's, it's a really bad deal in those high wage regions. Uh, regions. Also leads to uh, like, it just costs us more money. If we start paying everyone our highest rates, uh, our compensation costs would increase greatly. And we'd be able to hire way fewer people and our business model would work. Um, there's also, if you pay people above market rates, it's kind of golden handcuffs. Like they cannot, it's not, even if they don't like the company and want to leave, they might, they might stay because of the financial incentive, which is something you also don't want. You want happy people, not unhappy people that are just biding their time. And yeah, if we start paying everyone the lowest rate, we'd have nobody in the U S and like we need people in the U S there's a lot of customers here. There's a lot of people, uh, there, there's a lot of customers here. We need to support and, and we work or do a lot of work in the public sector. So, um, we think it doesn't make sense. I think the fairness argument is the thing is as remote works becomes more popular, all, all the salaries will, will start getting equal. But I think this is, it's a market. And I think fair in a market is market rate. 
Yeah. And they get like want to pay at or above. So we never want to be lower than market. And many times we're above market. That's fine, yeah. but not based on the role, not on the location. Got it. Yeah. Well, I think by saying at or above, you're already kind of cutting into the arbitrate like a bit into it. Um, I think if anybody had a chance to click on those links, those are five awesome reasons. Um, have trouble arguing with those one for one. I, I would just say it's it's an incredibly difficult conversation and it's timing. How does remote work eventually impact cost of living in different cities and how does just globalism in general impact cost of living in global cities? I think it would be like answering is capitalism good or bad? There are definitely bad parts to capitalism and capitalism has also lifted a significant portion of the globe from poverty. Um, so there's both sides of the equation. I, I think that there's you know, all these five reasons individually are great. Um, I still do believe that it shouldn't matter where you're born. You should have the same opportunity. That might mean that you should move to a different area one, at one, some point in your life. Um, but I think long, long term, uh, things will settle like as we become more internetworked and as other cities simply rise, uh, I think that will become less of a, of a difference. So Eugene asks, how do you onboard new employees? How do you share the, the learnings as a remote team? Uh, well, onboarding, uh, we do with the help of a pretty big template. Uh, so I shared that, uh, and it has all like the tasks you have to do, but also what other people have to do for you. So you're kind of, you can see whether stuff, what's still coming and whether people helped you, did what they had to do for you. Um, sharing lessons like we double every year in headcount um, so at the end of the year most people in the company are new they've only they've been there for less than a year um, so it's really important that we write stuff down so we have a pretty extensive handbook it's more than 1500 pages and many times like when we learn something we try to add it to the handbook or the documentation of GitLab or somewhere else but we, we tend to write things down and if you look at our handbook you'll find that there's a lot of the answers you might have joining a company are already answered. Um, Tammy just put a question into the Q&A there. Um, so Tammy asked, how transparent are your organizations in determining salary? Uh, for example, Buffer has a transparent salary calculator. Um, she's all about the calculators today. Awesome, I like calculators too. Uh, Buffer's calculator was an inspiration for us. Our formula is a bit different. I think better, but uh, uh, yeah, have a look at our global compensation uh, calculator. And uh, that for us, we don't share people's individual salaries because they go up and down based on performance. And we think performance is something between you and your manager. Uh, that's not the business of the whole rest of the company. And we want to, we want to um, have that be an, an, a, safe, a safe place. Uh, but we do have a calculator. Like if you know where you live and your experience factor, then you know um, how much you're going to earn. So the, the calculation is our San Francisco benchmark for the role, your location, the level, like are you a junior, intermediate, or senior, your experience factor, that is kind of a minus to plus 10% within the role, the contract type you have, are you an employee or contractor, and what country you uh, you live in. Oh, yeah, um, I think Buffer did an awesome job making it in, insanely transparent. Um, I don't know if another company has come close yet or ever will. Um, I'm sure that there were probably problems with being that transparent too. Um, I've, I've, I've looked at the literature and the companies doing that and it tends to not end super well. Yeah, um, how we do it is, is individual to the freelancer. So a freelancer is working on a project um, they will know exactly the rate that's being billed to the customer and the rates that they're getting and why there's a specific delta. Um, and we manage that delta based on the developer's experience. So if a developer can self-manage, uh, doesn't need any help with translation or anything like that, they will get the highest rates and we will have the lowest margins. And if they need a little more help behind the scenes from a CTO type or a chief product officer type, or sometimes with language, um, we will make a higher margin because we have to do more work. So if Turtle has to do more work, we take higher margin. If Turtle does less work, we take lower margin. There was a good statement by Andy Tiffany. Uh, for many companies, trust is more important for remote work. As a more senior dev, you've had the opportunity to build more trust and stronger relationships that can lead to remote roles. I think that's very accurate for hybrid companies. It tends to be they, the people who work remote are people that have already proven themselves either at the company or somewhere else, but they have a stronger relationship and that's why they're allowed to work remote. And uh, 
you mentioned uh, Yahoo earlier, um, or no, IBM, uh, no longer letting people work remote. I think for in many companies, I'll work from home is kind of code for I'll, I'll be taking the day off without taking a vacation day. And, uh, and as long as that's the case, remote work will always be kind of looked down upon. Yeah, and I'll also just, uh, you know, I, I want to avoid MBA terms in general in my life, but one that I do like a lot is manage up. Um, if you're working from home, if you're working remotely, if you're a junior dev, um, or in any case, like set expectations for what your team uh, or your manager should expect from you, meet those expectations and make sure that you publish meeting and setting those expectations. Um, don't expect that from other team members or from your managers. I think that's a very junior way to approach things. So someone asked, how do you manage contracts? Now, luckily we have handbook slash contracts, which are linked and lots of our contracts can be found on there. Um, for a contractor, we just pay a monthly rate for their work. So we say, hey, you're gonna help GitLab, you're gonna work on this. This is, this is what we'll pay you every month. So I think on that, we can jump to one of the things that we might disagree on, the 40 hour thing. Um, so I, I think in the same way that offices are uh, a leftover from the industrial revolution that we need to rethink, um, I think 40 hours a week is in the same category. Um, I don't think that humans are only effective in 40 hours. I don't think that work relationships should start with a very brief interview and then all of a sudden you jump into a full commitment. Um, I think there's a lot of value to 10, 15, 20, 25 hour arrangements, especially for um, people that might be dealing with something in life that means that they can't make work the number one thing for a specific point in time. Yeah, um, we have very few people working part time. Uh, we're not. Uh, it's possible. Uh, we do. We do allow it, um, but it's infrequent. And I think in a company, a lot as a company grows, more and more of your costs are kind of overhead costs, communication costs, like bringing people up to speed so that they can do uh, their job. Um, and there's a kind of a law of diminishing returns. As you get bigger, it kind of costs more time to just keep up to date. And uh, I think therefore in a smaller company, it's easier to work part-time and contribute. The larger company gets, the more overhead, the more those, like, those hours count. Suppose the overhead is five hours of just keeping up to date. Um, if you work 10 hours, 50% of your time is wasted. It's, it's not efficient anymore. Um, I'm not sure it works like that exactly, but I do think that's a component. Uh, I do think, I don't think it's a, so much about the hours. I think it's about flexibility. And um, there's a, someone left our company uh, today. Today is his last day. His name is Job, and uh, he wrote a post on Medium. Maybe someone saw it and can link it I in there. That was, that was incredible. He's like starting uh, helping other companies go remote, remote.com, right? Exactly. But I think he also touched on a time when he needed to be there for his family, and that was just okay. And he could just uh, focus on that. So I think people care less about the hours, but care a lot about the flexibility. If you have a life event that pops up that you need to take care of, you, you want the company to support you. And I think we're, yeah. we're, we're, that is really important to us and we're trying to be as generous as we can there. I guess I'm just wondering why, why can't companies set something up where, hey, for the next six months or the next year, I'm gonna go to 25 hours a week. I feel like you can transparently have that conversation, adjust a salary based on that or an hourly rate based on that and have that work. Yeah. You know, 25 hours a week can be covered in two or three days a week if you wanted to, but you're right on, if, you're, if you already have that covered in flexibility, there's not really necessity for it. We just look at it more from the freelancer perspective. Yep. We have the average freelancer in total works 25 hours a week and makes double their local income in total. Um, all right, uh, let me pull up. I don't think we have any new yeah, questions. And, and Andy asked a question in the Q&A. Biggest challenges GitLab is encountering today that can be attributed to remote working? Wow, um, I can... I'm, I'm going to cheat and tell a bit about the historic things. Um, historically, raise, fundraising was hard. In our B round, we got lots of no's or, and some or almost no's because people didn't think we'd be effective and people think we didn't be, make a good acquisition target uh, because it's harder to acquire the employees of a company if they're spread all around. 
Um, also hard is hiring some execs. Some execs say, look, I, I don't see this model working for me. Uh, so you, you diminish the pool there. A the great thing is you have a lot more people to choose from. And there's some execs that say, look, I want to move somewhere else, but I do want to work for a Silicon Valley type growth company. Um, so it, it helps too. Today, I think we still have a bit of skepticism. Uh, people asking like, hey, can't you open like a customer experience center or something like that? Um, but I, I think it's it's more manageable. Problems with remote working. I don't know. Um, someone quit last week and he said, look, I, I feel lonely. Uh, I moved to a new city. I have very few friends here. And, and with GitLab, I, I don't gain any friends in my city uh, because there's nobody else here. That's, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. The lonely piece is really, I think, unsolved and important. Um, like I use a, a service called Spacious. They convert restaurants and office space during the day. I love it. It's cost effective. When I feel lonely or bored or unproductive at home, I walk down to one of their office spaces. Um, that said, I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies like that to build the community aspect of it. And I think people and communities can start taking it upon themselves outside of just traditional work organizations to build that community aspect of things. Yep. And for example, at GitLab, we have like a, a travel stipend. You can just, we give you money to visit colleagues. Uh, I even like my home in the Netherlands, you can stay there for free. Um, like we, we want people to be able to travel and, and visit other people. Um, so we've got about five minutes. Uh, so we'll field any other questions that come in while we kind of cover one last topic. Um, so please feel free to add questions in Q&A or in the discussion to the right there. Um, thought we'd, uh, we'd talk about what does remote work look like in five years? And let's try to avoid the obvious as much as possible, like the whole VR and AR thing. Like we know connectivity is going to get better. We know that equipment and video is going to get better. Um, what does it look like culturally? What does it look like uh, globally? And what does it look like you know, from the, the org and individual perspective? Yeah. By the way, I don't think VR and AR are going to be a big help. Like, I, I don't see that happening. Um, maybe that you can have a, more of a sense of presence, but I'm, I'm, sli I'm slightly skeptical. Um, I think it's going to get way more popular for startups. Um, I'm seeing it already in the Y Combinator batches that the percentage of all remote companies is increasing, and I expect that to continue. So there's going to be there's going to be more of a people saying saying we're all remote or we're co-located. Um, but I, I think this we're remote first, but not really. Um, I think that's that's those people will have a harder time, and it people are gonna pick sides. People hopefully it will be in, um, embraced by people that care about the environment that people care that about spreading opportunities equally throughout the world because it's great for that. Um, and it's, it's going to be more known. Like right now, there has not been a New York Times article about all remote. And I, 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 think, I think that will happen. And ironically, we'll even have a big conference where we all get together. Or, uh, or all, you know, join the same link together. I think it will be an in-person conference, ironically. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, uh, the part that you mentioned on, you know, it hasn't been written about and organizationally it just hasn't been thought about that much. Um, I think we've got the better part of a century for how traditional office orgs are organized. And I just don't think consultancies or management organizations or simply seasoned executives have really thought about, okay, if offices didn't exist, if traditional work didn't exist, how would we build this from the ground up? I think thinking of it that way is more likely to tell what remote work looks like in five years. Um, what would organizations look like if they were formed remote first and commuting and offices weren't part of the original conversation, you know, compensation for how much money you have to set up a home office or to use a service like Spacious or WeWork or one of those if you needed to come into an office once in a while. Um, so I think seeing orgs and individuals help other orgs do this uh, will create a lot of thought leaders in this space and will create a a lot of infrastructure that doesn't exist today. Yep. I also hope that uh, we're successful and that someone gets the idea to make a great business case, uh, 
studying our handbook because I think it's one of the few instances where you have a public handbook with complete version history where you can see the evolution of a fast growing startup. Wow. How long has GitLab been running that? Uh, since 2015 or something. I think that's uh, really, it's probably hard to keep up and do and, um, you know, but once you get going, I think that's incredibly powerful. It is, it's, it's an unnatural act, but so far so good. Unnatural act, I like that. Um, well, we've, we're hitting right up against 1150. Um, I don't see any other questions in Q&A or in the discussion. Um, if there are any last minute questions, uh, please feel free to, to paste them in now. Um, otherwise, Sid, any last points? No, I, I think this was great, Flat, and uh, I'd gladly uh, do this again. Uh, we Thanks everyone for, for listening in and uh, for your questions. Really enjoyed uh, the experience. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining in and thanks, Sid, for doing this. Thanks, Flat. Take care.